Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, new webinar series that I'm starting called Tech Talk. This is a series where I'm going to bring you some of the cutting edge technologies. We're going to cover serverless computing, Internet of Things, edge computing, followed by machine learning, artificial intelligence, and some of the upcoming technologies. As someone who passionately believes in technology, I'm very excited to bring some of these emerging technologies to you. So every month, I'm going to cover one concept that's going to help you get up to speed with these emerging technologies. For the next couple of months, I'm going to stay focused on serverless computing. So for this series, I have chosen OpenWhisk, and we are going to look at IBM Bluemix as the commercial implementation of OpenWhisk. This webinar will be recorded and will be made available on YouTube. All of you would receive a follow-up email with links to the recording, as well as the code snippet that's going to be uploaded to uh, GitHub, and I'm going to make that available. This webinar will also have a follow-up article that you can refer to and, and go through the step-by-step -step process of trying the tutorial by yourself. So thanks again for joining, and let's get started. So the agenda for today's webinar is what is serverless computing, followed by an introduction to Apache OpenWhisk, and we'll briefly talk about the deployment models. And finally, we will explore OpenWhisk on IBM Bluemix. So before I go any further, I want to make sure you have some basics of this. So let me launch a poll and, and get your input. So how do you rate your serverless skills? It's absolutely fine if you have never used serverless computing or you're an absolute novice. This session is meant for beginners who are just getting started with serverless computing. So feel free to let us know where you are in your serverless journey. And my goal is to help you get started. All right. So I'm, I'm only saying 63% of you voting. I really appreciate if everyone can take a minute and tell me where you are in your serverless exploration. Excellent. So most of you have never used serverless and uh, some of you are novices and uh, a, a few are considered to be experts with some intermediary knowledge as well. All right, so thanks for participating in this. It does help me understand where you are. Uh, I also want to pull another poll. Those of you who voted as skills in the intermediary level and expert, if you can tell me where uh, you are in, in implementing serverless computing, basically your primary serverless environment. All right, so I have chosen the serverless environment available in the public cloud. That's the reason why you don't see some of the other choices you have. But in that case, feel free to choose other. It's no wonder most of you are using AWS Lambda, which is one of the very early implementations of serverless computing in the public cloud. So that's not very surprising. So thanks again for participating in the second poll. And it's time for us to get started. All right. So we are actually in a very interesting transformation. And I call this transformation as the fourth wave of computing. If this is the fourth wave, what are the first three? Well, x86 servers has been the very first wave of computing beyond mainframes and mid-ranges. The x86 servers have democratized computing by becoming more and more accessible, and that's when the actual IT revolution started. Small and medium businesses could afford to run servers in their uh, environments. Client servers started to become more and more popular. That eventually led to web and so on. But x86 was the first wave of computing. The second wave of computing started with virtualization, and the credit goes to VMware, who actually introduced a very affordable hypervisor and then made it possible to run uh, virtualization or VMs. So one server with multiple VMs was a norm 
uh, in the last decade and that has actually laid the foundation for what we now experience as cloud computing. So infrastructure as a service wouldn't have been possible without virtualization. So that's one of the key milestones in this journey. The third wave and the more recent wave is containerization. Piggybacking on the core capabilities of Linux operating systems, containerization brought a new mechanism of packaging and deploying applications. And eventually that also uh, changed the way Windows operating system is designed. So now it is possible for us to run containers both on Linux as well as Windows. And this is again one of the recent uh, paradigms which is revolutionizing the way software is designed, developed and deployed. And this is paving way to some of the emerging patterns like microservices. And the more recent and the most recent uh, very exciting wave of computing is serverless computing. And this is a paradigm where we never have to deal with infrastructure. There is a lot of debate on whether this is the appropriate term to call this wave as serverless. Nevertheless, it, it, is, it is accepted as serverless by a large part of the industry and the users. Um, so the focus for today's webinar is serverless computing. What exactly is serverless computing? Well, if you look at the way compute is delivered, today you have infrastructure as a service where you have virtual machines that are made available to you on demand. You can click a button, spin up a VM and start deploying your code and you are in the driver's seat. You are basically controlling everything. You are going to be the root user you can install anything and this is almost like logging into your own server but running remotely. That is infrastructure as a service. Then we have platform as a service where you have a slightly higher level of abstraction where you never deal with VMs but you deal with run times and you deal with languages and frameworks. So there uh, you, for example, you, you package your application like a jar file or a var file and then you deploy that application and the platform as a service environment will take care of the runtime uh, capabilities of, of, the, of the platform, of the application. But behind the scenes, platform as a service still manages the isolation of code and scheduling and it does a lot of stuff. But you take two things to pass. You take code plus also configuration. And this configuration will decide how you are connecting to the databases, how many units of uh, CPU, CPU is required, uh, how much of memory is required, uh, and some initialization. So, so basically, it is a level of abstraction, but you still carry code plus configuration. That is pass. The more recent phenomenon which we are currently talking about is serverless computing, where you don't really take an entire application and deploy like the way you do in pass but you take tiny code snippets that are written as stateless functions and you deploy them in this environment so instead of packaging a large application you actually break the application into one function at a time and you deploy them in this environment which is serverless computing so you are expected to write one function, test it, and then upload it to serverless computing platform. And after you have uploaded multiple number of independent, isolated, uh, autonomous functions, you decide how you're going to connect all of them to compose an application. If that sounds like microservices, well, that's what it is. Uh, I would personally call this as nano services because it is much more fine grained, much more granular and much more uh, stateless than uh, microservices. In, in microservices, it is possible for you to uh, package state. You know, for example, you could deploy database as a, as a service, which is a part of the microservice deployment. But in serverless computing, you write 
function with a very well defined entry point and exit point and it is short lived it's not going to be a long running process so uh, that is a function so the way you write a function uh, you can pretty much write it exactly the same way and you deploy it in this environment where your function becomes the fundamental unit of deployment and that's one of the reasons why serverless computing is also called as functions as a service or fast and this fits in in the spectrum you know where you have IAS with a lot of control uh, less flexibility actually you know it's not completely true uh, more control more flexibility depends on how you look at it and then there is pass uh, where there is less control and the flexibility increases then uh, of course um, after pass there are containers so there are container management and container as a service offerings uh, there you package your applications as containers as docker images and you run them in the in the environment and that is called cas container as a service and at the other end of the spectrum the other extreme end of the spectrum you have fast functions as a service where you don't package your applications at all you basically uh, take a function zip it and sometimes you need not even zip you basically upload and you start running them so that is the fundamental idea behind serverless computing there are multiple implementations as we have seen in the in the poll uh, AWS Lambda is one of the early movers in this space then Microsoft came out with Azure functions based on web jobs SDK that's been around for a while and Google announced cloud functions a while ago and that is still in beta and of course IBM is one of the pioneers and it, it also takes the credit of open sourcing the uh, serverless platform and, and currently that is available on IBM Bluemix as IBM Cloud Functions and we are going to take a closer look at this. So what are the attributes of serverless computing platform? Well, the very first one is it's an event driven computing model. What I mean by that is you have code that is going to be executed only when an event is triggered. If you go back to uh, visual basic programming, you know, uh, I, I started my career as a VB developer and I can relate to event driven computing model uh, because in visual basic when you create a form and when you put a button on it, uh, nothing happens till you click on the button and then a code is going to be invoked in response to the button that you have clicked. And that was the very first uh, incarnation of an event driven programming model. Of course, the, the eventing was based on the operating system and Win32 messaging, but the idea was you create a, a program that does nothing, but till you click um, on, on, on an interface uh, control, you know, like a button or a drop down or, or a list box or whatever. And that model was subsequently expanded to browsers and then um, Java came out with JFC and the whole GUI programming model was based on event driven uh, programming. Now imagine you are writing a set of functions and these functions will not be executed till an event takes place. For example, that event could be a sensor sending data that has exceeded a specific threshold or a transaction value that has exceeded a specific threshold or uh, someone clicking on a button on the web page right any of those are the events that could trigger and invoke the function so if you if you have if you are looking for running programs that are going to be in a loop and they're going to be running forever then serverless computing is not meant for that but if you are writing code that is going to be invoked in response to an external trigger that is the perfect candidate for a serverless computing deployment. So that is event driven computing model. The second one is paper execution pricing model. This goes very well with event driven. Uh, for example, if your function is executed for a few milliseconds, you would only be charged for those milliseconds. Of course, it is, it's extremely difficult to charge uh, on a millisecond basis, but uh, typically serverless programming models or serverless platforms are, will charge customers based on how many times your function was invoked and also how long was the function executed. So that makes it very, very fine grained. Uh, 
so so we have IAs where you know, VMs are running uh, on a on an hourly basis or sometimes minute basis. Then you have PaaS where you pay a flat fee uh, because it's very hard for PaaS providers to charge on uh, a compute unit because you know your code is provisioned and whether it is executed or not, it's going to be running all the all the time. So PaaS providers typically charge you on a flat fee based on the resources that are allocated to you, whether your code is running or not. Containers pretty much the same. You know the container is in in a live state. It is sitting inside a VM and there is a VM that is provisioned. So uh, you would still be charged for the underlying infrastructure even when your code is sitting idle, not doing anything. But when it comes to serverless or functions as a service, the fundamental difference is you will be charged only when the code is invoked and the code was getting executed. So that is the fundamental difference between uh, any other computing models versus serverless. Finally, the most important aspect of serverless computing is transparent resource allocation. You will never have to provision anything before you deploy your code. It is going to be very transparent. You will never have to bring up a VM, you will never have to provision a sandbox, you will never have to provision a runtime. There is nothing that you need to do except porting uh, your code to a serverless platform. And what happens when there are multiple requests and, and your function is parallelly invoked by multiple incoming events? Well, um, that is the responsibility of the serverless platform. It will uh, somehow scale your function to respond to these incoming uh, requests and incoming events. So that is not your, your responsibility at all. Uh, you, would, you would only uh, upload the code and, and at the most sometimes in some environments you can allocate certain uh, resources uh, that is the max that you are actually allowing your code to consume. So you will say uh, give me uh, a CPU share or give me X percentage of CPU or give me uh, one GB of memory max. So that is uh, drawing a baseline, but that doesn't really mean all those resources are allocated upfront. It is it is just a kind of threshold that you are go going to define. But uh, scaling is left to the underlying environment, and that will take care of multiple parallel executions of your code. So that is uh, the key difference, and those are the three attributes of serverless. Now coming to OpenWhisk. What exactly is OpenWhisk? Well, I encountered OpenWhisk almost a year ago and the first time I saw it, I was very excited because it's one of the first open source serverless projects originally developed by IBM and uh, uh, along with Adobe and both Adobe and IBM have donated the OpenWhisk project to Apache Foundation which has become an incubation project. And since then, this project has been getting a lot of attention, a lot of traction. And recently, Red Hat has also joined the bandwagon and they are looking at OpenWhisk integration with their platform uh, as a service, which is OpenShift. So there are a lot of companies that are backing uh, OpenWhisk and IBM is at the forefront because they, they are the company uh, who is making OpenWhisk commercially available on Bluemix as IBM Cloud Functions. And because it is running in the context of IBM Bluemix, obviously it is integrated very well with some of the core building blocks of Bluemix, like Cloud and Database, the, the Message Hub, uh, the Object Storage, and uh, some of the other core services of Bluemix. But the bottom line is, it's developed by IBM, donated to Apache, and currently it is at an incubation stage. And, and uh, there is a lot of interest from the industry in uh, taking OpenWhisk to the next level. So in terms of programming model and in terms of the technical details, since OpenWhisk is a FAS, it runs functions in response to events from web or mobile apps. Actually, it can be anything. Uh, it, it is not just web or mobile apps, but it could be even IoT sensors, IoT devices. Uh, any, anything that can uh, make a HTTP call can uh, invoke OpenWhisk functions. So functions can be directly invoked via HTTP. For example, if you, if you want to build an end-to-end -end application uh, that need not be triggered only through an external event like a clickstream or like a threshold of a sensor, but you want to really click a button on a web page and invoke uh, 
an OpenWhisk function, you can directly do it via HTTP. And there is a very nice integration with an API gateway and that API gateway will give you uh, a very clean mechanism of exposing multiple functions uh, that can be assembled together or stitched together into a full-blown application. So uh, this is an environment where it can really become a backend as a service with, with, with just a bit of plumbing. You know, you, you just need to have an API gateway and then expose all the endpoints um, and you build a UI that consumes those endpoints in a specific form or an order. So it is completely possible for you to build an interactive app uh, with OpenWhisk as a backend. So code can execute in response to a variety of events. Uh, it could be a plain vanilla direct HTTP call in a, in a very synchronous form, or it could be a database state change. For example, you've inserted a new row in a database and you want to create a trigger, you can do that. You upload a file to an object storage and that can trigger an OpenWhisk function uh, where you can do anything that you want with it. Um, you can actually wire any external event uh, as a trigger and, and, and you, can, you can basically create a very orchestrated workflow uh, with external events. So that is, that is the programming model of OpenWhisk. This is the architecture. Uh, I know this is uh, very early to talk about. We'll revisit this, but I want to uh, quickly put things in perspective. So basically at the heart of this entire architecture is the OpenWhisk runtime. And this OpenWhisk runtime is available to, to the outside world via a CLI, uh, UI, which obviously consumes the uh, API, the REST API exposed by the platform. There are specific SDKs. For example, there is an iOS SDK for OpenWhisk. Then you basically uh, create what is called as a feed. And this feed is, is nothing but, uh, think of it as a source, source of the event. Uh, this could be a database, this could be an e-commerce portal, this could be pretty much anything which is uh, triggering the actual event. And then uh, we, we create a trigger and trigger is the link between an external source and uh, OpenWhisk. So the trigger is associated to multiple actions and the action is where the rubber meets the road. This is where your actual code will sit. Um, so one trigger can be associated with multiple rules and uh, each rule can be associated with uh, uh, multiple actions and basically when you fire a trigger that trigger could uh, have a cascading effect on invoking multiple actions because a rule basically binds multiple actions with a trigger uh, you can also chain multiple uh, actions and and this is almost like a pipe in unix so you can basically take output of one, feed it as input to the other, and you can create what is called as a sequence. That is also completely possible in OpenWhisk. Uh, and then you can optionally invoke a third party service, right? For example, you want to invoke Twilio to make a VoIP call. You want to invoke um, uh, SendGrid to send out an email, or you want to uh, feed some data into a Hadoop cluster. Anything is possible because you're going to write code uh, that is that is basically responsible for making an outbound call to to any external service. It could be anything. So that is the high level architecture. Uh, we will take a closer look at uh, triggers, rules, and actions. Right. So that is the deep dive on the programming model. So services basically uh, define the events they emit as triggers, and developers associate the actions to handle the events via rules. It's a it's a lot of it's, it's a loaded statement. So I'm going to demystify this for you, don't worry. So basically, if you are getting started with um, OpenWhisk, you need to care about three things. The first one is called a trigger. The second one is called as an action. And the third one is called a rule. Now, you need to really understand what these three stand for and, and how they become the building blocks of OpenWhisk. So as a programmer, you will only focus on these three aspects. Of course, there are other things like uh, packages, uh, feeds, and sequences, and so on, but I will save them for the next webinar. So let's take a closer look at each of these building blocks. So let's start with a trigger. So simply put, a trigger is nothing but a class of events belonging to an application, right? Here you will, you will see a lot of 
triggers. For example, uh, a webhook coming from Facebook bot, uh, a GitHub uh, commit, or a Slack notification could be a trigger. A change in database state could be a trigger, right? And uh, the IoT devices sending data could be a trigger. And sometimes an interactive GUI operation uh, can also result in a trigger. Geolocation could be another trigger. So basically anything uh, which is more like an event, uh, which is raising based on a specific condition can become an input. And that is what is called as a trigger. And it is a very loosely coupled uh, architecture. So, so basically you create a trigger and this trigger can be very easily invoked by any of these events. As I mentioned earlier, the trigger is the bridge between an external event source like GitHub, for example, and OpenWhisk. So that's how you will link uh, the external world entities with OpenWhisk. Uh, action is actually where you'll write code. This is where the action happens. So it's an event handler that responds to an event. And, and when you write an action, you have no idea who is going to invoke it. So an action is going to be associated at, to a trigger at runtime. For example, you create a push notification action. So this push notification action is very generic. It accepts an input parameter and then sends out a push notification via uh, an Apple endpoint or a Google Cloud Messaging endpoint. But you never know what parameter is going to come in and uh, what is the source of that notification. You'll only write this notification. And then this code that you write for sending out a notification is going to be associated with a trigger. And that trigger is going to be triggered by an event source. Uh, for example, when you place an order, you send a, a call to the trigger and the trigger will say, hey, how many actions do I have? And then it discovers it has three actions. One action is sending a push notification. The second action is to send an SMS. The third action is to send an email. So it basically takes the parameter and throws it to all these three actions. And each of those actions will do their job. And then three different notifications in three different channels will get delivered to the end user. So you see the link between uh, an action and the trigger. And, and then what is a rule? Well, a rule is nothing but a lookup table that creates a one-to-many relationship between a trigger and action. So as I mentioned earlier, a trigger can be associated with multiple actions. So who will hold that one-to-many relationship? A rule is going to be responsible for that. So you create an action or you create multiple actions, you create one trigger, and then you create a rule associating a set of actions with one trigger. And when you trigger that specific endpoint, all the attached, all the associated, all the related actions will automatically get invoked. And this is the beauty of OpenWhisk. I have seen many other open source implementations of serverless computing, but they all fall short when it comes to real event-driven execution. The power of OpenWhisk precisely lies in the way the actions are associated to rules and rules are associated to trigger and a trigger is exposed through a HTTP endpoint. And when you invoke that endpoint without any idea of what is going on, a, a series of things take place. So that is the crux of OpenWhisk. So if you, if you put things in perspective and look at the workflow, well, there is a source, right? It could be, for example, a shopping cart. So a shopping cart is uh, the source, right? When a high value transaction is uh, generated, it goes in the shopping cart and that becomes a, a source. Now, somewhere there is a, a condition that says if the shopping cart order is more than $1,000, send a notification to warehouse and send a notification to the product manager. So that is the if condition sitting in the code, it could be even dynamic, but it doesn't matter. Now that is going to call the trigger, which is going to be order trigger. So the order trigger will receive this call and then it immediately comes to the rule and asks, 
how many actions do I need to send this? And rule will say you have three actions that are subscribed to this trigger. And then the trigger will take that input and pass it on to all the associated actions. And those actions will talk to the third party services or they will do what they're supposed to do and that will uh, result in the outcome. So this is, this is the actual workflow of uh, OpenWhisk. Pretty straightforward yet very powerful. Um, if you're wondering what languages you can use to code in OpenWhisk, there are multiple. Uh, the most popular one is of course Node.js, but you can write in Python, which is one of the recent editions. You can write in Java, you can write in Swift. Uh, and if you have legacy code like C++ code and you have done a lot of uh, work in, in, in uh, creating some logic and you need to integrate that with OpenWhisk Action, well, you can bring your own container. So you package the C++ code into a Docker image and you associate the Docker image with an action. So, so effectively OpenWhisk will invoke the Docker container without understanding or without even caring what's inside. So you can bring your own code and make them uh, an action. So that is, that is very powerful. Uh, there are a lot of other languages that are coming in like Go, Scala, Rust, you know, Julia, whatnot, so PHP. So all of them are in the pipeline and community is contributing and core OpenWhisk team is also bringing in additional languages. But the most powerful uh, serverless language till date is Node.js. And next comes in Python. Uh, when Python support is added, I was very excited because you could technically bring your powerful machine learning algorithms written in scikit-learn, NumPy, and even TensorFlow and run them inside OpenWhisk. So you can create predictive analytics as serverless and invoke them from a variety of inputs. So it becomes an extremely powerful machine learning runtime. All right, so enough of uh, theory and I'm uh, very excited to walk you through a set of demos. And as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, just not a, a webinar with slides. Uh, if you have been attending my webinars, you know it's a very demo centric and I, I, what I'm ensure from now is every session will have a, a, a GitHub repo associated with it and a tutorial uh, walkthrough associated with it. So right after this, you can actually get to the GitHub, uh, clone it and start tinkering with the code. So let me uh, get started. So. What I'm going to do now is uh, to, to, to show you how to really write your first serverless application, right? Hello world, let's get started with that. Well, here, what you see is IBM Bluemix. You can create a trial account. You can sign in, that's what I have done. And from the uh, catalog and from the homepage, you click on functions. So once you sign up with Bluemix and log into the portal, you will, you will actually see uh, functions. You can also go to catalog uh, here on the menu and that also has uh, functions in it, right? So you can, you can come down and you will notice there is functions. So this is basically the commercial implementation of Apache OpenWhisk. So this is a very recent branding change that IBM brought in. So how do you get started? Well, you can uh, click on manage and when you click on manage, you will uh, see a console. So this is creating an action. So let's call this hello, right? And you can choose the runtime. So currently uh, Node.js, PHP, Python and Swift are supported. So let's uh, use this and click on create. So this is a very nice IDE. Uh, an, an integrated development environment for you to uh, test uh, uh, OpenWhisk. So now we have written um, a very simple hello world, right? So now we can actually say save and invoke. So when you actually invoke, it does nothing, but it prints hello serverless world, right? Pretty straightforward. But this is not very exciting. Uh, this is a Node.js console printing a debug statement. So what's what's big deal about it? Well, um, it becomes interesting, it becomes exciting when you actually bring your code and do 
uh, additional things. And it, it's also more fun to use the CLI, the command line interface to deal with it. So let me delete this because we are going to now look at the other way of doing it. So currently I have no actions. So I go to get started, click on the overview and you can uh, download what is called as the function CLI. So this is a very nifty tool written in Go and this is going to uh, give us access to Bluemix environment. So once you download this CLI, you can you can go through these steps and you can basically uh, use command line to try it out. So I have already done that. It's not a uh, big deal. So now let's open my script, which is by the way going to be made available on GitHub. Or it's actually already available. So uh, once you go through these steps that I sh that I showed you earlier, you can actually check if the Cloud Functions plugin is installed by Bluemix CLI. So that is available. Version 1.0 is already available. So now uh, let me open a very simple Node.js application, right? So again, it is it is exactly the same what we have seen earlier. So it's a very simplistic Node.js application that prints hello world. So now let's use the uh, CLI to actually perform. So you can use BX WSK, which is Bluemix Open Whisk, or you could also use WSK directly. It's, it's the same. Uh, IBM is in the process of integrating Open Whisk with Cloud Foundry, which is their PaaS environment, and that's the reason why most of the commands or most of the documentation uh, points to BXWSK, right? So now we have the hello.js uh, available to us. Now we are going ahead and creating our action called hello. So WSK action create hello. But before that, you can also check if uh, you have any actions available. So when you type BXWSK action list, it just shows actions. There is no uh, action available. So now we'll go ahead and create it from the command line. So basically we are creating an action called hello and we are pointing it to our code snippet called hello.js. Bluemix will figure out that this is node.js and it automatically picks the appropriate runtime for us. So just hit enter and we have the hello action created. So when you now do an action list, it shows that this is the action name. This is actually the namespace. Uh, J plus hyphen uh, or, or underscore dev is the uh, workspace that I created. So it, it automatically appends and creates a namespace. It is just to isolate multiple projects. You may have dev test production. So it's a good idea to create a namespace and segregate your functions. And then it shows it's a private function and based on Node.js 6. So now we have the function. What's the next step? Well, we can go ahead and invoke it. So uh, WSK action invoke hello followed by blocking and result. So basically what this means is we are executing this function in a synchronous form by giving hyphen hyphen blocking and we want to see the result. We are not interested in seeing the entire payload. We just want to print the result. So once we hit, we obviously see hello world. What happens if you remove the result and hit blocking. Let's check that. Okay, so this is going to print a lot of metadata. It's actually a valid JSON payload, uh, which is coming back as response, but we are not interested in it. You know, for example, uh, how long did it take for it to execute? What is the namespace? Uh, what is the you know status? So it comes with a lot of metadata. So the moment you give hyphen blocking with result, you only see the result of the payload. So, so that is a, a very nice way of getting what you want. You can also send additional parameters, right? For example, here uh, we have an optional parameter. If the nothing is fed, we are populating that with world, right? So you can also pass parameters. For example, I'm passing my name here and this is going to now invoke um, hello Johnny instead of hello world because it has taken the parameter that we have passed. Um, 
then we can uh, do an asynchronous mechanism, right? Sometimes functions will take slightly longer. Let's say it is making a call to an external API. It is waiting for the API to come back and then it has to package that result and throw a payload to you. So it's going to take a while. So what happens if you uh, don't give blocking, right? So this becomes asynchronous. So now when you execute this, it is showing as an ID, right? And that's basically the hook for us to go back um, and, and check. For example, if I type WSK um, activation list, right? It's going to show us a uh, lot of, so all the previous executions are also shown here. Now you'll, you'll actually notice that the most recent one is the invocation that we are interested in. So this is the activation ID. So now that we have the activation ID, so if we grab this, this is the uh, state in which it is maintained and we run this command which is activation result followed by the activation ID. It, it shows us the payload because we are only asking for the result. So this is how you access a synchronous message uh, or a synchronous functions output. So after the message, uh, I mean the function is executed, it is, it is going to be uh, available and you can always use this to poll to see whether it is ready and you're getting an output back. So you can uh, again, you know, use list currently it shows you know there are multiple activations. So let's go ahead and delete uh, the hello function that we created. So now it is going to delete the uh, very first function that we created. You can again check with uh, list and it, it shows um, there, is, there is no function available. Now I want to create um, the same function but I'm going to pass a parameter, a switch that says web is equal to true. What this means is we are actually creating what is called as a web action. So a web action will not only create a OpenWhisk function, but it will also create an endpoint. So this endpoint is directly available to us uh, that we can access. For example, I can now use curl to uh, to make a call, right? And this is not secured. Uh, that is one of the key things to understand. Uh, you got to be very cautious when you are publishing your function endpoints to web because if you notice this is the endpoint of Bluemix followed by my namespace followed by the uh, actual hello.json. So when I actually execute this, it, it shows uh, hello world. So I'm using curl directly. So you got to be very cautious when you are implementing this because it is unprotected. This is unsecured. If you are looking at some tokens and some way of securing your uh, API call, then you have to use an API gateway. But uh, for, for simple demos, this is a great way to test. So you can always test your function uh, from an external tool uh, like a web page or a mobile app. And after everything is working the right way, you can move all of them behind an API gateway, create an API key and use that in the header uh, to make sure your calls are protected. So that was the very first demo, right? Where we have gone ahead, created this, and let's uh, clean up by deleting the hello. So now we have, we have no functions available. Now let's actually do something more useful, more meaningful, right? So I want to create a function that is going to send an email when a specific uh, trigger is, is called, right? So what I want to do now is to build an end-to-end -end, uh, OpenWhisk workflow consisting of an action, a trigger, and a rule. Uh, and we are going to just call the trigger. So let me show you what we are going to achieve here. So the very first thing that I have here is uh, a simple function that is basically sending the email via SendGrid. So if you're wondering what is SendGrid, well, you can subscribe to it, um, the free trial, and even after free trial, you can send up to 100 emails a day. So SendGrid is email as a service. It's a very popular uh, API for sending out emails. So I have signed up with SendGrid, grabbed an API key, and now we are going to use that within OpenWhisk to send an email. So very simple thing, right? So we are sending multiple parameters. 
and these parameters will be parsed into a from email id to email id the subject and the actual content so all of that will uh, come into openwhisk when we actually call the uh, action and then we populate certain uh, parameters and we finally call the sendgrid api right so uh, somewhere you'll actually notice that you know this is the entire body of the email uh, and then we call sendgrid.api uh, where we populate the request uh, payload and we'll get back message sent right so that is basically how we are going to invoke um, sendgrid from openwhisk the idea is when something happens we want to send out an email notification so pretty straightforward right so um, now what we're going to do is create this as a, an action right but before that we need to package this so I have a package.json uh, you know that has some dependencies on sendgrid and pm and so on so to save time I have already created uh, uh, node modules okay and what we'll now do is to basically take all the three and package it as a zip file so the next step is to take all these uh, files including node modules actually that's optional you can you can just use package.json but I'm going ahead and packaging everything into what is called as action.zip so this file consists of our index.js package.json and the node modules directory basically all the dependencies and now we're going to create an action like the previous one but this time we are actually using uh, the zip file action.zip that we created in the previous step and this contains a self dependent self contained function with all the libraries all the dependencies so now this is going to be responsible for invoking send mail api so let's go ahead and hit enter so now the cli is picking up action.zip and sending it to uh, bluemix so now the action is created called send mail so now we have to test this right so um, give me a second while I show you the inbox so so what we'll now do is come to the client directory and uh, to avoid typing long parameters what I'm actually doing here is creating a JSON file with parameters so this is from this is to um, and subject content you know pretty straightforward so now we are going to invoke the action that we created in the previous step called send mail with the parameter file where we have everything that is needed to send out an email so now we are going to hit enter and what this does it, it takes the parameter dot json and uh, sends it to the send mail action and now when I actually come to my email folder there we see hello serverless right and this mail is coming via openwhisk pretty powerful right this is a serverless email that we have just sent but that's not all um, let's actually complete the remaining steps right I want to close the loop by creating a trigger so now we want to create a trigger through which we can invoke the action because invoking an action directly is not a good idea and in fact it defies the purpose of serverless because if you are able to def if, if you are invoking a function directly it is not very different from invoking an API and there is a very tight coupling between the the consumer and the provider right the provider is your function the consumer is your um, calling program so the moment you create that you are basically hardwiring it is no different from invoking an API so to introduce that loosely coupled framework we are creating a trigger so now we are creating a trigger called notification so if you type um, trigger list we'll actually see that there is a trigger called notification but this trigger is empty it doesn't do anything right so how do you fire a trigger well you call um, trigger fire notification right so we are calling this function called fire and we are giving the uh, name of the trigger notification but currently this list is empty 
there are no associated actions to this trigger so the trigger does nothing and the trigger can exist independent of any actions that are associated with it so this is completely legitimate way of calling a trigger even if there are no um, actions attached to it but this is pretty useless so let's go ahead and make this complete so how do we bring our send mail uh, action closer to the notification trigger well this is how we uh, create a rule right so now I'm creating a rule and this rule has um, this the name of the rule is notify rule and it says notification is the trigger and send mail is the action right uh, so when we actually go ahead and execute this there is now an association between send mail and notification so when you trigger um, when you fire the trigger on notification send mail will automatically get involved the beauty of this is I can actually implement another function called send SMS and associate that with notification or I can also create another one called send push and associate that with my uh, trigger called notification and when the trigger is fired all the three will get executed now that is the beauty of uh, this loosely coupled framework of actions associated with uh, uh, triggers via rules so now we have gone ahead and created a trigger so now it's time for us to execute the trigger right so now um, what we'll do is okay let me change the parameters so this is parameters.json hello serverless from trigger right so this is the uh, new function that we are invoking actually not a new function but a function invoked via a trigger with a change of content so now we are going to invoke the uh, action not directly via the trigger so we are now calling the fire method on notification and we have no clue how many actions are associated with this notification now when we hit enter uh, nothing happens right so we we don't see the output because we are going indirectly to the action so you only get this ID now when we come back to the mailbox and in a in a second there we go we see a mail coming via the trigger right this is very powerful now you can actually invoke this trigger or rather fire this trigger from any application of your choice uh, tomorrow if you if you move away from SendGrid to any other email service no problem you can um, create another version of your send mail action and very nicely associate that with the trigger through the rule and then you fire the trigger and everything remains the same you will never have to touch the code um, of your client you know so so this is serverless way of doing things so that brings us uh, to the end of the demo right so uh, now you know things start to falling uh, things start to fall in place so you have source in in our case the source was basically the command line so that will fire the trigger trigger will ask what are the actions to be invoked and uh, rules will uh, uh, show all the associated actions and each action will be executed in parallel and you will get back the result in our case the result was an email so that is the entire workflow so uh, that brings us to the end of the session but uh, it's not over yet I want to bring up a poll very quickly before we go to the Q&A session so how relevant was the webinar content I, I hope you like this session and uh, please tell me what you felt about the content uh, I put a lot of effort to make sure that I simplify the concepts and package it in a way that you can easily understand and not just understand but go ahead and try this so um, I only see a few of you participating in the poll I appreciate if everyone takes time and, and participate here all right uh, it's very heartening to see that you know most of you found this relevant I really appreciate uh, your feedback so let me bring up 
one final poll and this is a straight translation to my delivery um, so how do you rate the overall quality of the webinar um, thank you uh, this is very useful while you are still participating here I want to show you how to access this code so on my github repo I created uh, uh, a new repo called TikTok, and within that you will see a tutorial, um, a step-by-step -step guide called uh, SendGrid tutorial. So you can basically clone this repo, follow this. I also created uh, uh, a very detailed guide, getting started with Apache OpenWhisk. You can um, come to the GitHub repo and click on this link to access the tutorial. It is, it is currently on my LinkedIn page and it has everything that you need to get started. So that was my promise and from now every webinar that I deliver will have uh, a GitHub repo and an article for you to immediately get started. So, okay, in case you haven't been able to see this because the poll was on, uh, so here is the GitHub repo uh, and you can, you can go to my uh, TikTok repo on GitHub and uh, from there you can click on this tutorial and go to this tutorial uh, section you know where I have everything that you need to get started so basically think of this more like a transcription of my session so you can you can try out everything um, step by step and you will end up seeing exactly what you have seen in this webinar so uh, thanks once again and uh, stay tuned if, because you have signed up for this webinar you will receive a follow up email with um, the details the links to the slide deck the youtube video the github repo and the article and i'll also come back to you on the next webinar and in september i'm going to do a deep dive on open misc we have just scratched the surface in the next webinar we'll actually build an end to end microservices application using an api gateway and consume it from a real application so Stay tuned for that and uh, have a great uh, week ahead. Thanks again for signing up for TikToks and I look forward to seeing you for the next webinar. Thank you.